Okay, so without further ado, let's move on to iron imaging. And to start this talk off, I want to give you a little bit of a background as to how this instrument works for iron imaging. So here is a schematic of the iron probe. It's probably exactly the same schematic you have up on your wall uh, in New Delhi at IUAC. You have a primary column here, you have a sample chamber, you have the transfer optics, and Okay, so so we have the um the iron microprobe here. So we have the sample chamber, the ions come into the transfer optics. They go through the electrostatic analyzer for energy filtering. They then go into the mass analyzer, the magnet here, and they come to the detection array here. Now, there are two basic ion imaging modes in the Kameka instruments. The first one is what we call direct ion imaging. And what direct ion imaging involves is that we transport an image from the sample which we've illuminated with a primary beam in either raster or spot mode of a certain size, can be a small or relatively big size. We transport that entire image through the instrument and we remake the image on some kind of position sensitive detector. So in this mode, essentially the primary beam, as I said, can be any size you want. Uh, and it's really the, the detector which determines the resolution. So the size of the pixel, for example, on the micro channel plate. But the micro channel plate is actually uh, non-quantitative. There are other more quantitative things available, although I believe Kameka have stopped selling the RAE. Um, and the, the Japanese group under Yorimoto have developed a so-called SCAPS detector that's very exciting, that is much more quantitative uh, channel plate. But anyway, in this mode, getting back to this mode, the transfer optics themselves determine magnification of the image. And it's the contrast aperture that determines the sharpness of the image. And then we have a field aperture that determines how much of the sample we see. And I can illustrate that here. So, as I said, the spatial resolution is set by the imaging detector pixel. Uh, the sharpness set by the contrast aperture. So here is a test grid. I'm sure you have one of these in your lab now. Um, and here is with a large contrast aperture, imaging this little area of the test grid in red here. And you can see that with a big contrast aperture, the image is rather blurred. But if we go to a smaller contrast aperture, we get a sharper image. Now, the problem with going to a smaller contrast aperture is, of course, we reduce the amount of material going through to be measured. So there's always compromises in this. Now, in terms of magnification, this is simply set by the transfer optics. The, the transfer optics on the IMS 1280 and the 1300 is essentially like the optics on a, a zoom microscope. You can just change the lens settings and change the magnification. So here you can see we take a, a different uh, Transfer magnification 45 times here on the left versus 90 times here on the right, and we see a much more magnified image. Now, direct line imaging uh, can also be used as a way to measure isotopes, for example, with the multi collector system. But one problem is when we're doing direct ion imaging, if we want to look at the sample, we have to have the so-called projection lens down in the instrument, and it blocks access to these high mass detectors. So we can only use three low mass detectors in this particular mode, but that can still be useful. Um, now, another aspect of, of direct ion imaging to bear in mind is a lot of the performance of the instrument in terms of high mass resolution is determined by having a very small image passing through the instrument. 
if you have a very big image passing through the instrument, you get aberrations, you get a less uh, well-defined peak flap. And so here's an example. This is silicon 29 sitting on the low mass side of silicon 28 hydride. Uh, this is a mass resolution of about 5,000 mass over delta M. And you can see we have a very nice peak flat on the instrument, which would be perfect for measuring isotope ratio. But we can only really do this when we image an area of about 25 to 30 micrometers. If we trans try to transport a bigger image through the instrument, we simply start losing the peak flat uh, to the extent that we can then no longer measure uh, precise and accurate isotope ratios. So there are some limitations here. You can only direct ion image a rather small area. However, we can use this in a very powerful way. This is something we did um, many years ago now. This is a, a study with uh, Gopal and Srinivasan back in 2007. We were looking at a, a um, Omani meteorite, uh, in, uh, which is from, uh, it's a lunar meteorite, as SAU-169. And I won't go into too many details about the where this meteorite came from, we have reason to believe it came from the Imbrium part of the moon because of its high thorium content, uh, which was based on uh, remote sensing of the moon. But what we find in this meteorite is it's full of tiny poikilitic zircons. So here is an, a direct ion image, and I'm looking at the, the species 90 zirconium 16 oxygen here. So I'm illuminating the sample over a a fairly broad area, and I'm looking on the channel plate to find the best place to put, in this case, an 11 by 11 micrometer square defined by the field aperture. And that is what we're going to put into the mass spectrometer. We're going to illuminate this, but we're only going to measure this area in here, which we've blanked off with the field aperture. Same with this zircon here. And we did this on a bunch of zircons, and we were measuring 204, 206, and 207 simultaneously. Remember, I can only measure three, so I can't measure 208 in this mode. Uh, but by measuring these three isotopes simultaneously, we found the 207, 206 age on average for uh, 14 uh, samples here, uh, 14 spots here, was 39, roughly 39, 10 plus or minus 10 or 15 million years, which is pretty much in line with the um, age of we expect and the age that is coming out of, of samples from the Imbrium impact basin. So this was an e example of direct imaging in action. Now, I wouldn't recommend using it very often. Uh, it's, it's, it's largely a setup tool. There's a much more powerful imaging mode in the instrument, and that is scanning ion imaging, or SII. And with scanning ion imaging, we do different things in the instrument. In this case, with scanning ion imaging, we use a very small primary beam. So it's actually the resolution of the spot size that determines the, res the size of the spot that determines the resolution of the image that we're taking. And the field of view is actually determined by the size of the raster. So we raster the sample in a square pattern uh, over the, the spot over the sample, and we extract ions. Now, you remember I said if you do a big image, transporting that image through the instrument uh, degrades the quality of the, the peak shape and degrades the quality of the, the isotope ratio information you can obtain. However, Kameka have built in this very clever system DTOS or dynamic transfer optical system, which is a synchronized raster with the primary raster. So you can raster up to about 400 by 400 micrometers on the sample. And then as soon as the ions come out from the sample, this DTOS system puts them back onto the ion optic axis. So all of the ions, no matter where they come from in a 400 by 400, up to 400 by 400 area, get transported along 
the iron optic axis, which means that we fully preserve the high mass resolution capability of the instrument uh, for the entire analysis. Now, in this mode, contrast aperture no longer determines sharpness, uh, and field aperture is only used to limit aberrations. They don't have the same microscope mode that they have with direct imaging. And when we detect, we, we can use all of the detectors in our detection array, and then the software essentially unscrambles this uh, dynamic transfer optical system. So, so it, there's a time of flight issue, it knows when the iron started, and it, puts, it knows where they came from in the raster, and it puts them back into an iron image that's built up in the software. This is a very, very powerful mode. Now, as you can see here, what happens is the, as I said, the sharpness is set by the, the sharpness is set by the primary beam. So if you use a big primary beam, there's a 10 micrometer spot, you get a blurred image. This is four, three, and two uh, micrometer bars. Whereas if we use a two micrometer spot, probably less than two micrometers, in fact, uh, you can see much sharper images here. Uh, and again, there's a trade-off. If you use a small primary beam, you get less secondary ions. So uh, there's unfortunately no way around that. This, whenever you go smaller, you lose transmission. That is unfortunately an inevitable fact of, of ion beam physics. Now the magnification, as I said, this is now set by the primary beam raster. Remember in direct imaging, it was set by the transfer magnification. Now it is independent of that. If we make a small raster, uh, we see this area on the right. If we make a big raster, we see this area on the left. And one of the great advantages now is that transporting all of our ions along the ion optic axis means that we can use all of our detectors at their highest mass resolution capability in any position along the axis, the focal plane. So we have five uh, electron multipliers available uh, to use to detect the ions coming out. So that's, as you can see, that's more than enough to do lead isotopes. Uh, it's also what we need, for example, when we do nuclear forensics or nuclear safeguards, when we're looking at uh, all the uranium isotopes plus uranium hydride. So then we use five in the same mode. Now, one of the great things about this is, as I, as I said, with direct ion imaging, you degrade the quality of the peak flat at a, at a large area. But with ion scanning ion imaging, here's an example. This is actually using a relatively modest raster of 100 micrometers. We can go bigger uh, and still retain these peak flats. Uh, so you can do a much bigger area with scanning ion imaging. Okay, so how are we going to use this with relation to zircon geochronology? Well, typically, I mean, I can, I, I'm not going to go into huge details here. Uh, uh, you can, you can pick up any paper written by many people in many labs on spot mode geochronology, uh, and you can see what we can do uh, with a 15 to 20, typically 15 to 20 micrometer spot which has a, has a depth penetration somewhere around about one, maybe two micrometers in a long analysis in a complex zircon. Um, now, the previous speaker showed some very nice uh, CL images. Uh, this is actually one of, one of my own favorites. This is a, an EOR key and NICE from West Greenland, the Amitsok NICEs. Uh, and what we have done in the past on the zircon is to put spot analyses into the core here. There's a clearly defined core. There's also a clearly defined embayment. This, this black area here is actually still zircon, but it's just zircon that is not showing up in cathodoluminescence. We then have another probably igneous growth phase around the outside. And then we have a little uh, white tip on the end here. And by putting spot analyses in, we're able to get the entire history of the EOR key and NICE complex in West Greenland 
essentially in one grade. So we have a, a core here that is around about 3.8 or more billion years. I think it's 3.82. We have this metamorphic corrosion of the core, which seems to have taken place at 3.74. We then have an overgrowth at 3.65. And then we have another metamorphic overgrowth at 2.7. So spot analysis is, uh, is tremendously important and is probably what you're going to use uh, the instrument a lot for in geochronology. But what I want to investigate is what can we do when we go down to a spatial resolution of between two to three micrometers, or now less with the Hyperion source, I would say this is an old slide, we could go down to one to two micrometers now, and a depth penetration that is really just a few nanometers. It's a very different mode. And this we're going to do with the scanning ion imaging mode. Before I do that, I need to just go through a little bit of a, a, a zirconology systematics tutorial. Um, I, I hope most people are familiar with, with the uranium lead systematics. Basically, you have 235 uranium decaying to 207 lead with a, a relatively short 700 million year half-life and 238 decaying to 206 with a much longer half-life of almost 4.5 billion years. So if you look at the evolution of radiogenic lead in a zircon through time, you generate a curve which we call the Concordia curve. And we can plot this in two different schemes. I'm going to use the so-called inverse or Terra Wasserberg scheme here, where we plot the lead isotope ratio, radiogenic 207 lead over radiogenic 206 lead, versus the parent daughter ratio, 238 uranium 206 lead. Now, if we analyze this, however we do it, TIMS, ICP, SIMS, whatever, if the analysis sits on this curve through time, at a certain point in time, we call it concordant. This is why and most zircons do sit on the curve and they are concordant. And so this is why we tend to think that uranium lead is often called the geochronologist gold standard because it, it produces these very uh, precise and accurate ages that we have multiple decay schemes agreeing on. So we know whether it's been confirmed. Now we have some problems. We can have lead loss because lead doesn't sit in a zircon matrix. It's unhappy. And so, so when you crystallize zircon, it, it incorporates uranium, but no lead. When that uranium decays, the lead has nowhere to sit in the zircon. Uh, it sits in a lattice damage site. And it can be more readily lost from the grain at a later point in time. Now, if this point in time is today or very geologically very recent, then the analysis will move sub-horizontally away from the Concordia curve. If it's an ancient lead loss, then it will move down towards another age on the Concordia. So it moves along a trajectory like this. Now, lead loss is uh, something we can use. We can, we can still use uh, data from, from Zircon that have experienced lead loss. Uh, we can often explain the lead loss in terms of metamorphic events. So it's very useful to us. Um, another problem we have, and this is a big problem in SIMS analysis, if we have high uranium matrices, say over two, 3,000 ppm uranium, uh, if we have bad relief on the mounts, uh, big ca canyons around the grains, poorly made samples, et cetera, uh, or one that I really warn people against, do not uh, burn your zircon with the electron beam making your CL images before you take it to the SIMS. That is a big no-no. You'll, you'll get beautiful CL images, but you'll ruin your SIMS analyses. So, so please bear that in mind. Now, what this does is it changes the calibration of lead uranium, and it moves the zircon often this direction to being reverse discordant. And we can't do anything with this. The only thing we can do is accept that probably the 207, 206 lead age is correct, but the lead uranium age is inaccurate. So we do all we can to avoid generating this kind of condition. 
Now, there is a fourth condition, and this is something that we could call lead gain, or if you prefer, uranium loss, but uranium loss isn't really something that happens in a zircon because it sits happily in the matrix. So this is this looks like lead gain. It's along an angled vector. Uh, essentially, it's unsupported radiogenic lead. If you take radiogenic lead away from the domain you're analyzing and separate it from the area where the uranium decayed to, to make that lead, then you essentially freeze the lead isotopic composition in time. And so it generates a, an array in this direction towards higher 7.6 lead ages and towards lower uranium lead ages. This is an uncommon situation, but we see it more and more. Uh, and we see it particularly in ultra high temperature metamorphic zircon. And so I'm going to give you a couple of case studies here. And the first of these case studies was one that was done some years ago now uh, with my colleague Monica Kusiak in, in Warsaw. And this is looking at the ultra high temperature metamorphic zircon in the Precambrian of East Antarctica. And this had already been noted uh, way back in some very early shrimp studies in Canberra by, by Ian Williams and Lance Black, that there were some strange systematics in these frames, that they seemed to be reverse discordant and also possibly too old. Now, when we looked at this uh, with, with Monica Krusiak, what we did, here's this Concordia diagram again. We analyzed many zircons in here. There is a known metamorphic event at about 2.5 billion years, which you see on Concordia here. And the data essentially defined an array going back in, in time here. But what we see is a rather ugly pattern. Normally, we would not be very happy seeing data in here, this reverse discordant data. Uh, they don't, there's no real explanation for these in a, in a normal zircon. Uh, they, they really shouldn't be here. The other feature you see is it's a little bit hard to, to define an age, but we think this rock could be about 3.3, 3.4. So clearly, many of these zircon up here are way too old, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6 billion years in terms of their 207, 206 lead age. What we also see are enormous uncertainties. So compare, for example, these grains down here with these grains here. This is a typical SIMS error, maybe about half a percent on 207, 206 lead. This is the error we're seeing on some of these grains, almost 10% plus minus, huge. So when we start to try to understand this, what we found was when we looked at the run traces through time, um, what we found was that we have very stable zirconium oxide, very stable uranium peaks, but we see these spiky of the lead peaks. And what this is telling us is that the lead is not homogeneously distributed within the grain. So we decided to try iron imaging to see if we could understand what's really going on here. And I'm not going to go through the details here. They're all in the paper if you want to start doing these kinds of analyses. Uh, but here are the first images. Uh, I apologize to this CL image. It's really terrible. Uh, there isn't much structure in this grain, but you can perhaps see this Y-shaped uh, thing here coming in. And what we see when we look at the trace elements this is the iron imaged area here. So it's about uh, 70 by 70 micrometers here. Um, this is a big bubble here. So I said earlier, please make nice mounts. We don't like having big bubbles next to grains, but if we have one here. Uh, so when we look at yttrium, we look at thorium, we look at uranium, we can see this zone, this kind of Y-shaped zone, defined rather well in the trace element. When we look at lead, we also see this Y-shaped zone defined in the lead concentration, but we also see these rather unusual spots all over the grain. 
Now, if we look at these spots, what we can do is for each of these spots, we can calculate an individual 207, 206 lead age using the, the software for image processing. And we can also make a map. So this is actually a map of the 207, 206 uh, age distribution. And what we find is that some of these ages are much, much older than they should be. Here's one that's 4.1 billion years. Here's another that's 4.1 billion years. There's no, there's no indication of Hadean rocks in this area. We don't expect Hadean ages. These are just clearly artifacts of this uh, distribution of uh, an isolation of radiogenic lead. And on the Concordia diagram, this is really how it, uh, how it works. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, an example here where we crystallize at 3.6 billion years and we have a metamorphism at say 2.5, then if we, if we isolate the lead at 2.5, we can generate data along a discordant array here, but in this case, we would know about it because we would see these grains becoming reverse discordant. It would set alarm bells ringing. We'd know we have to look at something. The problem is when we go into the EOR Archean, here's a 3.4 billion year rock crystallization age, metamorphosed at 3.8. And you can see you would not detect that this grain is discordant within its uncertainty as far back as 4.2, even though this is a completely false age. So this is a concern for a very old zircon that's been through high temperature metamorphism. You could be seeing wrong ages. Okay, so then we tried to look at iron tomography. We decided, okay, we have a SIMS, it's very good at doing very gentle depth profiling. Um, so what uh, the second example here is a little bit closer to the home for many of you. And this is looking down in the Kerala Condolite Belt in so Southern India. And this is some, um, some work done some years ago with a student of mine in Ravindra Kumar in, um, in Thiruvannathapuram. And what we found in here was in these charnakites in, in this elevotum quarry here, which have been intruded by pegmatites at about 520 million years. And many of you are obviously more familiar, even uh, more than me with the, the geology in this region. Um, what we found was the same pattern we saw in Antarctica. Here's the 500-ish, 520 million year rims. Here are the cores, and you see again, enormous uncertainties in the cause, and also this tendency towards reverse discordant. And this is despite the fact that these are beautiful looking zircons in cathodoluminescence. We would not expect them to misbehave. Uh, so we did an iron image study, and here are our individual iron images. Here's, a, here's a, uh, the original igneous core, nicely zoned. Here's the rim overgrowth. And you can see we have these spots appearing again here. We have the same story consistently throughout the samples in this charnakite. But then what we observed, and this was one of these serendipitous things, we just happened to have a free overnight on the instrument. So I ran a series of um, iron image rasters in the same place. And what we could see that was time as we went deeper into the zircon, some images, uh, some areas like in here, spots appeared later. In other areas, for example, here, spots appeared, spots disappeared and then appeared. And I have a little video running here. I hope you can see it. Uh, just showing as we depth profile into this grain, how some of these spots are coming and going. So, this gave, gave me an idea. Uh, what we can essentially do is accumulate all of these slices, depth profile slices, for and on the surface, we can define areas. Here I've defined green, blue, and orange. And we can look at each of these panels going through time. So it's a depth profile. And here's 
the blue ones. This is just a schematic of how it might be distributed. So here the green isn't visible in the first panel, then, then it appears, then it goes away, then it comes back. The orange is somewhere in the middle. The blue is visible from the beginning and then disappears. And we can make a depth profile. We can calibrate the depth of our pit and we can look at these uh, different images, these different spots, uh, the lead concentration coming and going as we go deeper into the grain. And what this was able to tell us is that while we have a lateral resolution of about one to two micrometers, uh, we have a depth resolution that is enabling us to see that these, these uh, little lead clots are actually present at around about a 10 nanometer, 10 to 15 nanometer scale. And this is something that has subsequently uh, been tested by particularly by Monica Kusiak using TEM in, uh, in Potsdam. And uh, we found in many of these UHT zircon that these, uh, these lead clots are actually uh, lead metal. They're actually lead metal nanospheres. Uh, we don't really fully understand 